Greetings everyone, my name is Aryan Salman and I'm honored to be engaging in this insightful conversation with Professor Dr. Maria Guhardo today. Uh, welcome to the Fireside Chat at the 25th edition of the Education Leadership Forum. We are very grateful to have had the privilege of hosting the distinguished Professor Dr. Maria Guhardo, a celebrated professor of leadership studies from Soka University, Japan, and co-editor of the book, Value Creating Education. Thank you all for investing your time with us today. We truly value your presence and participation in this important uh, conversation. Professor Dr. Maria Guhardo needs no introduction, but allow me to highlight her remarkable achievements. Professor Guhardo, as many of you may know, has recently co-edited Value Creating Education with Dr. Emiliano Bozio for Outlook UK. Her research interests span global citizenship, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and critical pedagogies. Uh, Maria San, as we all uh, address her, holds uh, the distinction of being the first female and non Japanese dean of the Faculty of International Liberal Arts and vice president of the Soka University. Her leadership and scholarship have made significant contributions to the field of education and have influenced experts and practitioners worldwide. Over the past few days, our forum delved into the critical topic of preparing learners with skills necessary to resolve conflict and foster peace. May we aim to expand the conversation uh, to the concept of value creating education within the framework of global citizenship and critical consciousness development. Let us welcome Professor Dr. Maria Guhate. Thank you so much, Arian. My pleasure to be here with everyone. So, Professor, uh, we did go through the book. Uh, it was quite insightful. Uh, thank you so much for curating it for all of us. Uh, and for starters, can you help us understand what value creating education is? Well, I know that there are teachers that um, hopefully are present. I know that the commitment to education that the Global Citizenship Foundation has held and, and has um, served to inspire many. So along that line of thinking, Value creating education is, let me tell you what it's not. It's not a detailed curriculum. It's not a checklist. It's really a way about becoming more human. It's about bringing that spirit and that ethos into the classroom. So how can we nurture the capacity of every learner to realize and fulfill their own potential and also contribute to the well being of others. So, value creating education is relational. It, it can only happen when we are in presence with others in that learning space. And so, it's, um, I would say, Arian, it's sort of like a kaleidoscope. Do you know the kaleidoscope when you look through it, that little like tunnel, and it's got all those colors, and the, every time you turn it, new color shapes emerge? I would say to you, value creating education is in the spirit of that kaleidoscope where there is brilliance and it's different for each one of us. When you turn it a little bit, the colors you see are a little different than the colors I see. But as long as we keep turning it, the, the full image comes forth. And so in some ways, I would use that metaphor to describe value creating education it's it's the capacity to bring that forward not only for yourself which is very important this isn't just self-help how do i become better but it's about as i transform as i evolve and emerge as a better human being how can i then have a sense of purpose and a relationship an engaged relationship with others so that I can also contribute to your well-being. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gardo, you have been a first-generation learner and you've inspired uh, people around the world like me. Um, so can you share your personal experience uh, or an anecdote that inspired uh, your interest in the concept of value education? Well, I'm reminded, Aryan, that um, it's not curriculum that changes and touches our lives, but it's the teachers that were in our life. 
I have never heard anyone say, oh, my third grade reading curriculum was what transformed me or my eighth grade algebra curriculum changed my life. I've never heard anyone attribute curriculum to life changing experience, but I have heard many individuals say it was this one teacher that saw me. It was this one teacher that pushed me. It was this one coach who believed in me and asked me to do better. And for me, that was a very real experience. I'm the daughter of Mexican immigrants. Uh, my parents were peasant farmers. They came out of the jungles of Northern Mexico from the state of San Luis Potosí. And I was born and raised in the United States. Spanish was my first language. And my parents made that journey of leaving their home country because they believed that there could be something better for their children. It was really the sense of um, looking into the future but not knowing exactly what it would hold. And so education was what was the motivator. And so they crossed the border with three small children in tow, had three more on the other side of the border in the United States, and I was one of those. Spanish, my first language, my parents never knew how to read or write since they had no formal education. Um, and yet I knew that education was important. In third grade, for me, it was my third grade teacher. It was Mrs. Garcia who looked at me, saw me and asked me to do better. And because of that, I began to very cautiously move forward and I began to love reading and studying and learning. Oh, just, I mean, I was one of those small children who could not afford books. And so my, my Disneyland was actually going to the public library. I mean, that's where I found books. And so, so coming out of this experience, Ari, and then it really led me to value education myself personally, because similar to many others, the experience of learning and being educated opened doors and created bridges to others and opportunity. And I strongly believe that that, that should be available to many, that creating that access is what makes a difference. And if you were to ask me, Maria, why do you do what you do? I would say to you, it's because I have made it my personal goal and mission to create that access for other learners, for others, for parents who are questioning, should I send my son or daughter to university? I never went, I don't know. And for me to reassure them, you've done a great job raising them so far. Don't worry, I'll, I'll take care of the rest here. I'll do my small part and continue. So, so yes, it's very personal. It's very personal. It's also a very hopeful journey. And I believe that's what education brings. It brings hope. Thank you so much, Nelson. Um, doing your studies in DIB and uh, your own personal experiences that you shared right now, uh, how do you think, uh, say, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging uh, intersect and affect educational policies and practices, particularly within the context of value-creating education? One of the foundational elements of value-creating education, as I earlier mentioned, is this premise that the teacher's role is important in terms of their relationship to the student. And so in the work of diversity, equity, inclusion, as we move from just representation to that, to inclusion, which is a sense of belonging, I find that value creating education when done within the spirit of which it was intended, of creating value, not just for yourself, but also for others, with this sense of, in fact, becoming a global citizen in the best spirit of that word, um, contributing to social change. At the end of the day, becoming a better human being, that can only be done when I can understand my own power 
and my own sense of presence in a learning environment. And it would be my hope, and I, I believe that this is the foundational piece of value creating education. It's that spirit of recognizing that it's not enough for representation. I want you to be that change agent. I mean, I've had the privilege and pleasure of listening to the speakers in the last couple of days and even our workshop presenter, Grace, just before my session now. And, and I love that every one of these individuals in their own way, especially on the first day, this idea that let's, let's talk about young people as change agents, not as victims, right? So this sense of agency is very present in value creating education. So it is a pedagogy that is philosophically inspired and that inspiration moves one to want to be a better human being. And I don't say that lightly. I mean, we just heard Grace speak about uh, peace, cultural violence, structural violence, and, and how we want positive peace. Well, value creating education does sit, does rest on this premise that if in fact we want a better world, if in fact we want that positive peace, it is necessary for each one of us to go through this individual transformation, this, this human revolution, if you will, in order to be able to uncover, discover, recover our possibilities and our contributions. So inclusion, I would suggest it's not only inclusion, but it's inclusion and belonging in the best sense of the word. So in my response, uh, in your journey, you're talking uh, I, uh, a few moments ago about global citizenship. So in your journey of advocating for global citizenship and critical pedagogies, such as value creating education, uh, what have been some of the most significant challenges or what have been some of these challenges you've encountered and how did you navigate through them? I would like to suggest that there is much that is unspoken or assumed when we begin to speak about global citizenship education. And I think it's very important, for example, that it be gendered, that we include the 50% of the population that is often excluded, right? So we can't talk about global citizenship education if we're not talking about social justice, the sharing of power, equitable representation and participation. So one of the challenges is how do we shake this loose and open it up and create more access? So the gender perspective is very important and is a challenge because it's often excluded. And I think the other challenge that speaks to me is the challenge of purpose. Global citizenship education has a purpose. And if we don't name that purpose, it then falls to whosoever voice is loudest or whatever curriculum is most popular or whatever textbook supplier has the best marketing scheme, right? That is what happens often in education. Education is driven by our textbook suppliers, by companies making millions off of our children in our educational institution. So what are the challenges? The challenges of speaking up, Arian, and being able to give name to the structural issues that are often invisible, unspoken, assumed. And I think that if we step back and if we harness this, this question, our own response to, to purpose, what is the purpose of global citizenship education? For what purpose? You know, there's a motto at my university, um, if, and I'm waiting for you to come visit. So when you come visit, I'm going to take you to this statue where this motto is engraved. And it says, for what purpose shall we seek wisdom? Again, that we could say for, you know, basically it's asking for what purpose is education? And to your question very directly, global citizenship, for what purpose? If it's to continue to perpetuate capitalism, I think we've missed the mark. But if global citizenship 
education is in the spirit of being able to be better and do better because we know. Then I believe we have, there's hope. There's hope and there's promise there. But it's a challenge. It's a challenge because my marketing budget, it does not compare to the marketing budget of big textbook suppliers. So we have to be careful. Just because it's popular does not mean that it is complete. Now we come to something very important. Um, so we come to a popular one uh, that's developments around uh, AI. So considering the emerging trends and developments in technologies like generative AI in education and work, uh, do you anticipate these developments, uh, which are uh, popular at this point in time, uh, uh, do you do you anticipate that these advancements will influence or impact the future of education, particularly the demand and need for, say, value creating education? I think that the emergence of AI and technology um, can be very seductive, and it can be the shiny object that we now turn our attention to and. I think it's very important that we take a breath and ask that question, what is the purpose of education, right? The purpose of education is not to promote more iPads and computers in every classroom. That's not the purpose. That's a strategy. That's a tool. The purpose of education is to fully realize the capacity of every learner. And in that process, I as a teacher or as, as the educator am also being transformed. So AI in and of itself and these, these technological advancements as you described them are changing, are changing the landscape, the sea of education. And it's, it's incumbent upon each one of us whether we are in the classroom or whether we are policymakers or whether we are graduate students aspiring to get a job someday, right? Whatever our position may be, we have to, we have to start with the question of for what purpose? So will it complicate education? It will only complicate it if we don't ask the hard questions because there are ethical questions that need to be asked with the introduction of technology. There are fundamental questions that need to be asked. I mean, in some countries, we exist in a learning environment where we're teaching to a test. And so then the question is, if that's what you believe the purpose of education is, then AI is going to help facilitate that. However, if you fundamentally believe that the purpose of education is to contribute to humanity through one's own sense of presence and self, then AI may or may not facilitate that. And so part of the question is to what end? To what end? And so I would just encourage us all, Arian, to keep asking the hard questions. And if you think it's there's a simple solution here, if you think it's just economics, I think you're missing something. Because if we go back to what is value creating education, it is relational. Now, I have a cell phone somewhere around here. It's probably charging right now, right? Honestly, I don't have a very humanistic relationship with my technology. In fact, it's a real love-hate relationship. So part of what I'm, I'm just suggesting is that we can't lose sight of the importance the fundamental importance of human relationships. So, I just want to get on to what you just shared. Um, how do you view the role of, say, spirituality in education, uh, in fostering global citizenship, critical consciousness development? Is there a connection between, say, spiritual intelligence and value creating education? Philosophically inspired pedagogy, which is what many 
pedagogies are. For example, Montessori education is philosophically inspired. It's philosophically inspired by Maria Montessori and what she believed was the best learning space for children. Uh, Steiner education, Waldorf, is philosophically inspired education. Value creating education is off also philosophically inspired. And what that means is that it comes from some fundamental beliefs and suggesting spirituality. Sometimes people are afraid of that word because they believe they trans they transpose it with the word religion as opposed to principles, life principles or a life philosophy. And that's how I view spirituality. So what I would say is that spirituality actually begins to define our essence. I'm not talking about religious practices. I'm talking about what makes Maria Maria? What makes Aryan Aryan, right? What, what makes us the human beings that we are? And so I teach in the field of leadership studies. I teach global leadership, the psychology of leadership I'll teach this spring, women culture and leadership. And in speaking of leadership, I often say leadership is very personal. While some people may come up with a checklist, it's very personal. It's about who you are as a human being, what you believe about others, about followers, and so to me, those beliefs are driven by your life philosophy or your spirituality, right? We have different words for trying to capture that, that essence. And so value creating education definitely has some fundamental pillars or elements. For example, dialogue is one of those elements. Dialogue captures the essence of connecting with another human being and using this exchange, this experience as a vehicle for transformation. So dialogic learning is part of value creating education. The spirit of creative coexistence is also one of the pillars of value creating education. And it speaks to this idea that I am because you are and you are because I am, this idea of interdependence. Right. And so that is also philosophically inspired. Right. So spirituality, I think we have to unlearn the, 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 the narrowness that some have imposed on that word and actually see it as a superpower. It's a strength. If you know your values, if you understand why you do what you do, that to me is spirituality. And I would love to have another conversation about that. That to me is, is really getting to the essence of each one of us in our capacity as educators, as learners, as parents, as family members. Who are we? Um, so I think similar to AI, spirituality often feels like it's taboo and we, shouldn't, we should be afraid of it or we should be very cautious. And I would suggest to you that it's, it's about jumping in feet first and saying, let me be curious about this, right? I don't think it's about having answers. I think it's about having great questions. And that curiosity is what will allow us. So value creating education is about that curiosity. Who am I and how can I contribute to your well-being? So, Maria, what, what do you think would be uh, some of the challenges in uh, promoting or uh, incorporating value creating education given the context? Um, a lot of schools uh, follow certain curriculums that might not have value creating education uh, right, in, right center to their uh, existence. So, uh, what, what are some of these challenges? How do you think an educator who's interested in taking this forward, uh, what, what do you think they should, uh, how, how should they approach this uh, issue? Well, I love that question because it allows me to think about 
the contributors to this book on value creating education that was just published. And the contributors are educators and policymakers from around the world. It's individuals from the United Nations asking the question, how does this approach to learning support sustainability and development? How, it was an educator in um, looking at Cuba and value creating education in Cuba and asking, how does that differ from how we understand it from the perspective of the the founder of the perspective that I am speaking of here. So at the turn of the century, Sunase Buruma Teguchi was an educator in Japan. And he began to pose this, this framing. And so that's what I would say is one of the myths that there's a curriculum that you can just buy off a shelf and say, oh, now I can do value creating education. In fact, Makaguchi said the most important individual in this educational enterprise is the teacher and the evolution of the teacher and who the teacher is becoming in the presence of their students. And so this, this transformation is key. And yes, so this would, this would be, this would be one of the first steps, how we move forward. So will teachers, teachers will say, I can't do one more thing. And I, my response would be, I'm not asking you to do one more thing. I'm asking you to do what you do differently. I'm asking you to take a breath and to be present. And there are many competing demands on our teachers. I'm not suggesting that this is easy, but we have choices. We have choices every time we step into that learning space in how we want our presence to be, how we want to show up. Will I engage? Will I allow myself to be vulnerable? I mean, value creating education is going to suggest you need to be vulnerable. You need to be able to allow yourself to learn, to make mistakes, to figure things out because you are also human. So I recognize that this isn't about, and it's very important to state, value creating education isn't about buying the latest curriculum. This, this will only transform education when we individually transform ourselves. So it comes back to this idea of a human revolution, right? How do we change in order to be present in a different way? Now, it sounds, actually, as I even hear myself now, it sounds so simple or like, well, then how is this different from anything else? And in the in the contributions that educators made to the book, we begin to see, for example, the role of reflection. Do our teachers have time to reflect, to think about? And there are contributions from educators who examine this and suggest ways to, to reflect. And so um, I think it's really important Again, and I'll come back to this because at the end, someone's going to say, well, where can I buy the curriculum? And I'm going to say, the hard work is a beginning with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, um, what, what, what do you think could be some of the myths around value creating education? We have a mind from a teacher who's uh, somewhat interested in like you know, changing their way of teaching uh, so they make the choice so what are the myths that uh, they could be tripping on uh, and something that they could avoid i think that one of the myths especially for our younger educators that i'm not old enough yet i i don't know as much as the person who's been teaching for 30 years or you know i'm brand new it's my first year and i would suggest to you actually that's your superpower your superpower is that you're not bogged down by all that history. Another myth is that somehow all the knowledge is in the book and I would say, no, it's not. One of my favorite educators, actually I have two and I'll name one. One is Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educator who promoted critical pedagogy. And in this approach to learning, he suggests that 
One, we need to engage in dialogue, but we need to do it in a in the truest fashion of it being transformative. And so whether you've been a teacher for one year or for 20 years, it's about learning how to engage in this process of dialogue. Dialogue, some people think, well, it's just conversation. I talk, you talk, I talk. It, that's transactional conversation. I would suggest to you that the, the heart of dialogue is listening. When was the last time you listened to, let's say, a child or a young person and didn't interrupt them? My small brain often is saying to me, oh, I wish they would hurry up. What's the point? Get to, yeah, I'm busy. I've got appointments and work. And But what if, what if we allowed ourselves to listen? So that's another myth. The other myth is that what we know from the past or lived experiences somehow aren't valid. And that to me is wrong. There's no other way to put it. It's only because of my lived experiences that I am who I am and this is how I show up in the classroom, right? The fact that I'm the daughter of immigrants matters. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's not something that I hide. It's not something that somehow, I mean, there are many of our children, many of our students have this experience. I teach at the university classes where 50, 60% of my students come from other countries. They're not Japanese. And they're questioning, where is home? How should I be here in this country? And speaking of inclusion, Japan isn't always the most inclusive of countries. And it's a struggle, but that's a struggle that is mirrored in many classrooms around the world. So value creating education is saying, start where you are. Value who you are and where you've come from. That relevance of learning matters in the classroom. Our students need to understand that their lived experiences, whether it was in Malaysia or in Mumbai or in Sao Paulo, Brazil, that's the experience I want in my classroom. So there are many myths, many challenges. I can't do it because I don't know enough. And I would say, you know enough. There just needs to be a few guideposts along the way to help. So my, son, my next question is around uh, guidance. <laughs> so for, for an educator who is new to value creating education, but is highly motivated to advance this approach, what would your advice be? Uh, where should they start? And I, I have a tip for them, but then I want okay. to know. For you. <laughs> Value creating education is going to require that you examine yourself uh, and be willing to change. And that, I think, for us as human beings, it's a gift, but it's also one of our biggest challenges. Value creating education is asking you to examine the purpose of education, why you do what you do. And, and we can all do that. So another one of my favorite educators is a Western educator from the United States. And his name is Parker Palmer. Now Parker is almost 90 years old, but he, has, he is one of the top educators of the 20th century. He is just amazing. And Parker says, you teach who you are. So what is the first step? Parker would say to you, you have to be willing, courageous enough to examine who you are. What are your values? What is your life philosophy? What guides you? Because that is what you bring into the classroom. Regardless of which textbook and which tests and which principle you may have, once that door closes and you're with the students, it's you and them. And I think to be able to, as first steps, to be able to embrace that and to create a space for reflection. 
those are some of the first first steps. I want to hear yours. What's your, what would you say? My aside, uh, I would say read the book, Meditation. I think it was very, <laughs> very interesting and enlightening for us. Like, even at the foundation, we, we are trying to question, like, you know, how are we going about things and like, trying to rethink some of the things that we've been doing uh, based on the ideas we got from the book. Uh, so personally, for, for me, it has been a very rewarding journey. Uh, and that's what made this entire experience rewarding for me, uh, going through the book, uh, connecting with my team. So I think that was a very rich experience. So any educator that who is interested in like, you know, improving themselves, I think this is, this is a lot more personal as a journey. Um, perhaps going through the book could give you ideas and insights. So the book might not have all the solutions for you, uh, but it would spark ideas that go beyond what what uh, one might think of. So that's that would be my suggestion. Now I have one question to you, Maria San. So uh, co-editing uh, the book must have been an enriching experience for you, as much as it was for us to read. Uh, so can you share some behind the scenes moments during the editing process uh, that particularly resonated with you? And if you can share something that nobody does. You know, um, it was my first time going through this process. And so I'm asked, well, how did you find the scholars that contributed? And actually, it was this brainstorming session of, of coming up with dozens of names and beginning to reach out and invite. And what I didn't expect was how life would get in the way. So there were potential contributors who were very excited and wanted to write a chapter for the book, but then life happened. Someone's father passed away. Someone had a very serious illness. I mean, there were just, there were just things that were out of one's control. I think on the flip side of that, Aria, one of the things that I loved was that there were contributors that were following through, but then it got to that last editing cycle because every chapter was peer reviewed and, and edited multiple times. And in one of those stages, two of the young scholars said, I don't think I can do this. I don't, I don't think my chapter will be good enough and wanted to stop. And I said, no. And my co-editor said, no. And to be able to encourage um, a young scholar, but an, a seasoned educator, um, to be able to encourage that particular individual to break through that, that, that wall of, I don't think I can do it, of doubt, right? And, and to be able to see it come to fruition. I think the other surprise was how moved I was by, the, by the, the chapters that were contributed. There was one that I read and after reading the first draft, and this was the first draft, I was in tears. I was so moved, so moved by the, the humanity in, in the way the chapter was written. I mean, I could feel the educators that they were describing. I felt as if I was walking shoulder to shoulder with that educator and I just, and honestly, at the end of reading the first, the chapter the first time, I cried. And so I didn't expect it to be such a personal experience. I'm, you know, it's, it's an academic experience. You're editing a book, you're editing, reading, but it was very personal. And my determination, Arian, was that nobody would be left behind. And this is the same philosophy that I bring into the class. I tell my students, no one will be left behind. We are in this together and we're going to be there for one another. And some of you, I say to them, are going to feel like your English isn't strong enough or you don't have the same academic preparation as others and you don't think you're smart enough or you didn't have the money or you're barely eating because you can't afford meals. And I tell my students straight up, I'm not letting go of you. We are in this together. 
And that was the same spirit that I brought to this book. So it brings me to tears now just because after, it took two and a half years for it to go from concept to completion and um, just being able to see the brilliance that came through in those chapters. Um, everyone should have this experience. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Maria, thank you. for sharing your heartfelt experience. Um, I, I really, really feel honored to be part of knowing your experience and like, you know, having gone through your book. Um, it was personally very enriching. So thank you so much. Now I invite the audience to uh, ask their questions uh, and open the floor to them. So we have one question already. And we look forward to that. So first, I'm showing the question here by Hassan uh, for you to see. Uh, what the first can you get to educate? So you get students on the education and share value of experience while respecting other sections and views. As in my own, so we tend to be changed to take the values after the book. I find that, um, and oftentimes my students are very surprised, but I find that bringing my own personal experiences um, professionally, I mean, I don't go and just share, but I share with intention and purpose. I share with the spirit that there is a lesson to be learned here. And I connected to the relevance of the content. And when I, when I demonstrate that, I then ask my students to do the same. And I understand that we learn best when we're in community. So my classes are always organized in small groups. And it is your group for the semester. And that's who you will sit with. And, and some students love it and some students hate it. And they want to sit with their friends. And I, I randomly, you might say, arrange students in small groups but it's with the spirit of, I want you to build community because learning happens best when one is in community. So I, I think there are many ways to build community in a classroom. In the absence of that, you're, you're trying to climb the mountain without a compass and without the right shoes, right? So you've got to, you've got to know what, what, what strategies do you need? The mountain is very high, so be equipped. And I would say part of that is just understanding how does learning happen? And, and I would suggest it's relational and it's best done in community. Thank you, Maria. So the next question is how can we support our learners to keep us strong in their lives? I'm sorry, I did not hear that question. Can I so the next question is, how can we support our learners to keep a strong belief in themselves? How can we support our learners to have that strong belief in themselves? I think that so much of that depends on us as educators, being able to really see and sense the presence of each one of our students. Um, I don't, ex I tell my students, I don't expect you to have the perfect answer. That's not what I want. What I want is your curiosity. I want your curiosity to be bouncing off the walls, to be coming forward, to, to be adding to, to the dynamics of our learning experience. And so that to me is very important that that we create that opportunity um, to be able to see them when they don't see it themselves quite yet. And there's, I mean, I feel so fortunate and blessed that there's so many stories of, of that. My student who said, I want to apply to University of Oxford, but I, I don't think I can. And, and me just saying, well, I'm writing the letter of recommendation. So it'd be really good if you put in an application and and then just to see them with their master's degree now, working at a international organization. I mean, it's 
there's so many of those stories. It's it's that sense of belief. And, and, and I think what's hard is for us as educators to silence our judgment. Many of us were raised in communities or in households where we were judged. We were expected to do certain things a certain way, to aspire for certain jobs, um, a certain profession. And we, that may have agreed for us or agreed with us or maybe not. And so to be able to just encourage our students. One of my students presented her capstone and I thought, oh my gosh, I just saw a university professor and she just looked at me like, what are you talking about? And, and then to be able to see her go on and pursue her studies. It's, and now working in one of the finest international schools globally. Um, that's what's possible. That's what's possible. So do we, we need to suspend our judgment. We need to listen more. And we need to actually see every single student as they come in. Do we learn their names? I mean, I ask my students, why do you guys like coming to my classes? I'm one of the hardest professors, right? Why, I give you more reading than anyone else. And one student said, you see me. This is the only class where I made friends. And I thought, if I did nothing else this semester, I, I earned my paycheck right there. So I'm passionate about this, Ari, and I, I feel like every, every learner should have the experience of being seen. Thank you for this, Maurice. Uh, I have the last question for you for today. Uh, and I think it's connected to the answer that you shared right now. So what are the attributes of a value creating educator? So this is our last question and this is the end with. Well, that's a great question. I had not thought about that, but let me just try. Um, we have to approach learning with humility. I may have a PhD and yes, I was educated at Harvard and yes, I have done many, many things and received many awards. But at the end of the day, when I go into a new classroom, I walk into a room with 30, 40, 60 strangers and I need to be present and not about myself, but about them. So humility is is one of those characteristics. We have to be curious. Oh my gosh, I wish every teacher I had ever had had been curious. I didn't see that curiosity, except here and there. I, I, want, I want to be curious because I want to, to be able to live and practice what it is that I'm expecting of all of you. And so I think I'll just close with that. We have to walk our talk. Being a global citizen or being a value creating educator, it's not just about rattling off the definition or the three choice words. It's about living this experience. It's about starting every day and saying, I'm going to do my best. My students deserve that from me. And maybe the system is oppressive and maybe I'm discriminated or maybe how do I work as a female in a Japanese hierarchical environment? I mean, there's so many things that, that cause me to take deep breaths. And yet, I have to start my day every day by asking, how can I do my best? Because when I do that, my students, I hope, will also see that this is possible for them. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much, Maria San. Thank you so much, Maria San. Without knowing the truth, you know, some of the comments, but it's the principle of Sana Mansuri, who is saying that they want to be a student. So I think literally all of us uh, feel like being in your class. So thank you so much for being here and again, us on this discussion today. So, as we conclude this insightful and engaging conversation with you, I'd like to extend a heartfelt gratitude to you uh, 
Professor Guharjo for your invaluable insights, contributions, and generosity on behalf of the Global Citizenship Foundation and all our attendees. And to all the members and guest attendees, uh, you are the reason for our being. So thank you. Uh, you are, therefore, we are. Thank you so much for being uh, part of this transformative dialogue over the course of three days and letting us support you in your journey of growth and impact. We really, really appreciate your time, insights, and efforts that all of you have contributed to driving this extremely crucial discourse towards shaping the many futures of education for generations of educators, education leaders, and young people. We would like to emphasize how important your feedback and suggestions are to us. And uh, we'd like to show you that like, you know, we try to drive the discourse and dialogues and activities based on the feedback. So please feel free to reach out to us. We'd be very, very grateful and uh, delighted to hear from you. So uh, if you have any topics or experts that you want us to bring uh, to uh, our future events, please write to us. My team and I look forward to your input. See you soon. Until then, take care, stay safe, and spread love and compassion. Our world needs it more. Thank you.